So welcome everybody. My name is uh, Theo Lavin and today I'm going to talk about uh, learned image coding. So maybe a very brief introduction about myself before I start the talk. Uh, so I uh, have a very uh, prestigious academic background because I graduated from INSA for both my uh, engineering degree and uh, my PhD. I actually defended my PhD exactly two years ago. Uh, and since then, uh, I work at Orange on learn coding as a permanent researcher. So I work with a few people that you may know, uh, Pierre Philippe, Felix Henri, and Gordon Clare. Uh, I also work with Thomas Leguet, who is here. Uh, he's a PhD student. He's supervised by Olivier Desforges. And uh, we'll have a new PhD student in a few weeks, with, which will also be supervised by Olivier and uh, Jean-Ran. So my talk is about uh, learned image coding, um, and it will be divided in two parts. The first part uh, will be able will be about uh, autoencoders. Well, we'll see the uh, pros and well many cons of autoencoders. And the second part will be about uh, will be about uh, Kuchik, which is all lightweight codec that we have developed as an alternative to autoencoders. So uh, in a bit of uh, in a kind of spoilerish way, I subtitled that. Uh, do we really need 500 watts to decode a video? Uh, because that's one of the issues of the autoencoders. But let's uh, start with the uh, with the good part. So let's suppose that we have O image here. Uh, we want to reduce its size. Uh, let's say by a factor of 40. We can use JPEG. So even uh, with this projection, you can see that JPEG is clearly uh, not very good. Hopefully, uh, people have been working on uh, different algorithms. So if we use HVC, it's a bit better. We could use VVC. Here, the difference becomes quite subtle, and it's always tricky to show uh, <laughs> images on the screen. But uh, VVC is clearly be uh, better than HVC. Or uh, we can use a learned uh, autoencoder, which uh, maybe you can see on the cross or on the clouds that we have way more details. Uh, so the conclusion of this uh, illustration is that uh, while the progress of conventional codecs are, let's say, slow and steady, so we need 30 years to go from JPEG to VVC, uh, the progress of learned uh, codecs are quite fast because it started in 2016, maybe. Uh, it, it needed a few years to achieve VVC-like performance, and then uh, it's now well, better than any other uh, conventional codex. Uh, so that's a first takeaway. Maybe you weren't aware that uh, learned codec in image at least are way better than any possible uh, conventional ones. Uh, now let's see how it works, uh, like the big picture. So it's usually implemented using autoencoders. So the idea of an autoencoder is to take one image to apply on it uh, what we call an analysis transform. So it's a big uh, a big transform with many convolutional layers inside. Uh, it produces latent uh, variable in the form of feature maps, which describes well the feature of the image. And then these uh, feature maps are sent back to uh, something very close to the input image using a synthesis transform. So, in uh, vanilla autoencoder, we train both the analysis and the synthesis transform to minimize some kind of, dis of distortion. It can be, for instance, a simple uh, mean squared error. If we want to do uh, coding, what we're going to send is the uh, latent representations, the feature maps. And we're going to do it by uh, adding a probability model, which will allow to do some kind of entropy coding to lossless map uh, the latent uh, variable to a bitstream back and forth. And uh, we'll also train this uh, entropy, uh, this uh, probability model alongside the two other parameters. Uh, so the actual equation that we optimize is the distortion of the input and output images, uh, plus the rate uh, required to reconstruct the output image. Actually, what we do uh, when we train a encoder is we train a docoder on many images. So we take uh, several thousand of images and uh, we try to minimize uh, the average uh, rate distortion. So, yeah, just for the top, 
uh, the figure about how many parameters we'll uh, usually have in, for instance, the synthesis transform. It, it would be the same thing for the analysis or the probability. It's a stack of convolutions with millions or dozens or hundreds, maybe millions of parameters. So what's important in an autoencoder? Uh, the first key thing is that we are jointly optimizing all parameters uh, together. It's quite different from what uh, happens in a conventional codec. If you take VBC, for instance, we have hundreds of people uh, working on VBC. Each of them are the very, very small part. Uh, they usually ignore all the other components of the system. They just focus on one part using often a proxy metric, which is not really, uh, really the rate distortion cost of the, of the image. And uh, people are doing that since decade, which well results in a system which can be quite suboptimal because everything is uh, engineer engineered uh, separately. The second thing, which is not really uh, the point of this talk, which is uh, nevertheless important, is that uh, we can use a distortion metric which is way more advanced than the simple uh, PSNR. Uh, so, for instance, we can use MSSIM, LPIPS, or even a GAN-based metric, which allows to obtain a, a more accurate estimation of the quality of the image. And it's uh, very important to obtain good results, but I won't talk about that at all in this presentation, but it's still important. Uh, all right. So that was the good uh, point about uh, autoencoders. They perform very well. Now, uh, is everything perfect? Obviously, no. Uh, and the uh, bad thing about, about uh, autoencoder is the decoder part. So the, the decoder part is, uh, is the part which goes from the bitstream to the reconstructed image. So it's just these two uh, transforms. So the, the decoding of the latent from the bitstream is in the probability model, and then the synthesis of the image. And uh, that, uh, it must be very low complexity because usually the use case is uh, Mr. YouTube or Netflix encode the video once on their very big computers. Uh, and then we, as user, are going to decode the video many times on your laptop, on your TV, on your set of box, on your smartphone. And so it must be very efficient to, uh, to be able to run on the low, low power device. And uh, we're going to see that it's not uh, the case at all. So here we have a graph of performance against complexity. So the complexity is measured as the number of multiplication per decoded pixel is one metric of complexity, which can be arguable, but it's still <laughs> one metric of complexity. And on the y-axis, you have the relative rate required to achieve the same quality than VDC. Uh, so if you're on the top of the graph, uh, you're worse than BBC, and if you're below the x-axis, you're better than BBC. Uh, so this quality is measured as the PSNR, so we don't talk about subjective tests and GAN-based metric and so on, so uh, it's yeah, just measured as PSNR. And we can uh, put a few points on this graph, so we have different autoencoder-based uh, codecs, so the very well-known system from Ballet from 2018, uh, the one from Chain in 2020, and the one of the uh, state-of-the-art system uh, from this year. And the last thing that we may add on this graph is the performance of, of HDBC, just to have a sense of scale uh, on this graph. So 30% of our BBC is uh, roughly HDBC. Now, the good question is, well, it seems complex because we need 100,000 multiplication or 1 million multiplication to decode a single pixel, but how complex is it uh, really? And to answer that, we're going to ask ourselves how much computational power or how many watts do we need to be able to perform this number of multiplication in order to decode in real time 4K video at uh, 50 frames per second. So if we have a low power GPU, something like an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which uh, consumes uh, around 10 watts. We don't, uh, we're not able to perform more than 3,000 multiplication per pixel if we want to decode this kind of uh, frame rate and resolution in real time. So if we have a little bit more power, so an uh, RTX uh, 3090 uh, with 350 watts, we can barely uh, decode the ballet system. And if we have a top-notch GPU like uh, this one, 
with almost 500 watts, hence my subtitle, uh, well, we're not uh, able to decode the chain of the NIC++ uh, plus plus decoder. Uh, so that seems annoying uh, because we have very good systems which outperform all possible uh, conventional codecs, but it's clearly uh, unrealistic in a complexity point of, uh, of view, and even with dedicated hardware, we can't do it. That's where all codec uh, uh, under the scene, because we're going to uh, design a, a codec with a very low decoder complexity, and we're going to do that using overfitting. So usually overfitting, overfitting is something that we try to avoid. Here, we are going to using uh, overfitting on purpose to uh, decrease the complexity while maintaining good performance. So let's go back to this equation. Uh, we've seen the good parts of this equation. Now, let's see the bad parts. Uh, and one of the key things to understand is that autoencoders, they do their rate uh, distortion optimization once and for all, on average, on the big training set. So they are good in average. And in order to be good on any possible uh, signal images without uh, touching the weights, because once the training is done, you can't touch the weight, they have to have a lot of weights and a lot of complexity to deal with any possible images uh, and to be good on all images. And we believe that it's an important issue, uh, almost a design flaw, because we shouldn't be able to code all images. We just want to be good on the image that we want to send. And that's the key uh, idea of our codec, is that we're going to learn one decoder for one image. So for each image to code, we're going to learn the appropriate decoder to decode this image. So uh, here we are back with our autoencoder. So we just want to learn one decoder. We just focus on the decoder part, so the part from the bitstream to uh, the output image. Since we will now have uh, parameters on the of the two transforms which are uh, adapted for the image, we need to send uh, these parameters uh, because they are unique. They are made for this image. So the bitstream, uh, they will also contain the two parameters, psi and theta, uh, on top of the latent space. Then, since we only uh, focus on this image, we don't need the expectation anymore. We are just going to optimize the rate and the distortion of this current image. So we shift the average optimization to the to an uh, image wise, wise optimization. And then, uh, because it's easier to do, we're going to directly learn the latent representation. Uh, usually, the latent representation comes uh, from an encoder, which we apply on the image. Uh, there is no point doing that. We can only uh, optimize, we, we can directly optimize the latent representation to find these uh, three parameters, so both the signal and the operation applied on the signal, which optimize uh, the distortion and the rate of this particular image for this particular rate point. Is that clear? It's the big, the big uh, part, part of the presentation. Well, right. Uh, so let's just detail a little bit the different components. So we'll start with the synthesis, whose role is to go from the latent representation to the decoded image. So the structure of a latent space will be a simple set of uh, hierarchical 2D latent grids. So one full resolution, one half resolution, one fourth resolution, and so on and so forth, until uh, 164 of the resolution. Uh, this latent grid will first be upsampled with a very tiny neural network with 64 parameters to obtain a dense representation, so seven feature maps uh, with the same resolution as the image. And these uh, seven feature maps will be fed to a learned uh, CNN-based synthesis with a very few number of parameters, uh, usually a few hundred, 1,000 at worst. And this uh, do the mapping between the latent space and uh, the decoded image. Then to retrieve the latent space, we need our probability model. So what we're going to do is, uh, let's suppose that we have already decoded the dark blue pixel. The light one are not available. Uh, we want to know the value of the orange one. So we want to decode it from the bitstream. We're going to use a few neighboring uh, pixels uh, as a context, so usually 12 or 24. 
these uh, pixels will be fed to uh, an MLP, once again, very lightweight, a few hundred of parameters. This MLP will compute an expectation and a standard deviation uh, based on the context. So knowing this context, we expect the value of the pixels to be mu, and the standard deviation gives us a, a sense of uncertainty about uh, the prediction. We we'll thus model the distribution of uh, y i knowing c i as a Laplace distribution that we will give to our entropy decoder, which will read the bit stream and uh, output the, the proper value. And then we repeat the same process for the uh, neighboring values. So if we put everything uh, together, we have this entire decoding pipeline with our uh, autoregressive probability model, which uh, lead to the hierarchical latent representation, which is upsampled and synthesized to obtain the decoded image. That's the decoding part. And so the encoding part is just the optimization, so plain uh, neural network optimization with gradient descent uh, optimization of the latent space and the three uh, small neural networks to minimize the distortion and the rate of this particular image. This takes a few thousand of iteration, a few minutes per image. Uh, so here, what we've done is that we've reintroduced this idea of, uh, as in HDC or BBC, let's say, or encoder, it looks for the best option available at the decoder. So it looks for the best parameters. The way of looking at the best parameters has changed because in uh, VVC, it's a discrete uh, optimization between different uh, hardwired mode. Uh, here, we have a continuous optimization of uh, continuous parameters for the different neural network, but it's, it's basically the same idea than a uh, conventional encoder. So now for the interesting part, so the results, uh, our goal is to be on the left of this kind of arbitrary line, but still want to be on the left of the 10 watts uh, line. And what we propose is uh, these two points. Uh, so one below the 1,000 uh, multiplication per pixel uh, on par with HVC, so still good. And one which is better than uh, HVC without being uh, as good as VVC, uh, but which is still roughly 100 times less complex on the decoder. Uh, than a comparable uh, autoencoder. Uh, so this is the key results of this presentation. It shows that by using overfitting, I mean by learning one decoder for each image, so by spending a little bit uh, more time on the encoding part learning the decoder, we can decrease drastically the complexity while maintaining good uh, compression performance. Uh, so that's the second takeaway. We're both uh, quite good compression-wise and uh, way more efficient at the decoder. We also conceptually simple uh, because our decoder is just 1,000, 2,000 parameters in five to eight convolutional layers according to the architecture that we have chosen. And so it's very easy to implement. We just need to implement a convolution and that's it, we have our decoder. Uh, and all of that is allowed by the fact that we've replaced the average ray distortion optimization by an image-wise uh, optimization, which is actually quite similar to uh, what's done in HVC or VVC. So as usual, a few ideas about our future work. Uh, so I've talked at the beginning of my uh, talk about the importance of the subjective quality metrics. So everything here is done with a plain L2 loss, but we could uh, benefit more from the fact that we have a learned codec by plugging inside the distortion, something like a GAN-based loss, which would uh, improve the subjective results of our system compared to HVC or VBC uh, even more. Uh, by the way, we have an internship offer for uh, last year, uh, engineering student uh, master five. Uh, so if you know students interested, not hesitate. And uh, Thomas, who is here, is currently extending this uh, work to video coding because if we want a lightweight decoder, it's uh, actually for video to be able to output 50 frames per second. And that's quite a lot of work. Uh, and uh, that almost conclude my presentation. Uh, so everything, both the encoder, the decoder, and even some pre encoded bitstream are available on a GitHub. So do not hesitate to have a look if you want to try out and compress your own images.